Long Island's parkway system is quite unique. For many people throughout the United States, the word parkway is not even in their vocabulary. Freeways and interstates dominate the landscape, flowing neatly in and out of major cities. But here on Long Island, the parkways serve as the most essential roadways for our nearly 3 million residents. But the state of our roads may cause one to wonder, what could have been done differently to improve the flow of Long Island's traffic? Will we ever be able to drive across the Long Island Sound? And why exactly does the Northern State Parkway take such an abrupt curve to the south? We're going to answer these questions and more in this episode of Long Island's Hidden History. We begin on the Southern State Parkway. Robert Moses, the chief pioneer in the development of Long Island, originally conceived the Southern State to be a linear park, a winding country road through rural Long Island where city folk could escape the hustle and bustle of the city. The scenery and fresh air could be enjoyed from the road as well as in the many parks along the way. This concept is believed to be how the word parkway caught on in the first place. About five miles east of the Queens line, between exits 17 and 19, lies Hempstead Lake State Park. Today, the southern state cuts across the northern edge of Hempstead Lake, with exit 18 leading directly into the park. But a look into the earlier days of Hempstead Lake will show us that this was not always the case. Starting in the 1870s, Hempstead Lake was a reservoir supplying water to New York City. By the time the parkway was built in 1925, the reservoir became defunct and the area around it was turned into Hempstead Lake State Park. The southern state's original passage through the park was actually what is now Lakeside Drive and Peninsula Boulevard. This map from 1947 shows the original route. As you can see, the parkway curves south, down the west side of the lake, across the southern edge, and up the east side, curving east again at what is now exit 19. In the same year, 1947, the more direct route we know today was established across the northern section of the lake using man-made fill. The old route was abandoned until about a decade later, when the former roadway was repurposed into Peninsula Boulevard. So yes, the area of Peninsula Boulevard south of Mercy Hospital used to be the Southern State Parkway. The grassy, tree-lined median along this section is a surviving remnant of the former parkway route. Back on the west side of the lake, Lakeside Drive bears a more subtle indicator of its former use as Southern State. Naturally, a guardrail was needed along the stretch of road running alongside the lake. Today, along Lakeside Drive, this guardrail is still in place, coming to an end at the exact spot where the former parkway would veer away from the lake. It can be easily identified by its rusted appearance just across from Parking Fields 1. Now the parkway system we know today tends to be heavily congested, and traffic studies indicate it is getting progressively worse. Apparently, some of Long Island's early planners anticipated this problem many years in advance. Believing Long Island's roads needed a little more breathing room, some backed a proposal for an additional highway through Nassau County. This proposal was the Western Nassau Expressway, which was to be signed as Route 101. Though the original proposal was much more grand, Route 101 did come to fruition as a short roadway on the North Shore. Beginning at Northern Boulevard and Roslyn, it extends northward for four miles through Port Washington, ending just at the start of the village of Sands Point. However, the original proposal was for the 101 to be a main artery through central Nassau County, leading all the way down to Atlantic Avenue in Freeport. Residents opposed the idea of yet another parkway running through their neighborhoods, and with the completion of the Meadowbrook Parkway in the 1930s, the Western Nassau Expressway was deemed unnecessary. In hindsight, the addition of this roadway could have provided great relief to present-day commuters. If early planners could have seen the gridlock we experience today, they may have thought differently about the addition of the 101.
Speaking of residents opposing parkways, let's now take a look at the Northern State Parkway. Looking at the map, you've probably noticed the way the Northern State takes a sharp curve at Glen Cove Road. Why exactly does this east-to-west roadway run north-south for two miles? The answer lies in the village of Old Westbury. The parkway was constructed around the same time as the Southern State in the 1920s. During the planning phase, residents of Wheatley Hills, a section of what is now Old Westbury, sharply opposed the idea of a major roadway running through their neighborhood. Old Westbury, one of the wealthiest suburbs in the United States, was settled by some of America's richest families, including the Vanderbilts. The social elite of the area, believing a parkway running through their neighborhood would destroy their property values, led an opposition against the parkway, demanding it be rerouted to the south. However, Robert Moses and the State Park Commission worried this would defeat the purpose of relieving congestion on the North Shore. Eventually, a portion of the land that is now the Wheatley Hills Golf Course was acquired by the state, which cleared the right-of-way for the parkway's current route, circumventing Old Westbury while still remaining accessible for North Shore residents. This subsequently allowed the Meadowbrook Parkway to be tied into the northern state near Carl Place, which again was another reason the Western Nassau Expressway was deemed unnecessary. Although the Western Nassau Expressway never came to be, plans for a new expressway further east were born in the 1960s with the addition of the Seaford Oyster Bay Expressway, also known as Route 135. Running from Seaford to Woodbury, the SOB's planners were rather indecisive about its fate, leading to some very obvious remnants of the original plans in the landscape. Part of this is how the expressway ended up with its name, Seaford Oyster Bay, when the actual northern terminus is in Woodbury. Let's first take a look at the southern terminus. At Merrick Road in Seaford, there appears to be a road to nowhere beyond the final exit. This is because the 135 was originally supposed to extend further south to meet the Wantaw Parkway, providing access to Jones Beach. Although these plans were dropped, most of the land acquired for the right-of-way remains intact as a wooded area, running right through the residential area of Seaford. By looking at the map beyond the end of the road, you can clearly trace the right-of-way all the way down to the Wantaw Parkway. Within the neighborhood, the right-of-way can be clearly identified as it cuts through the residential streets. Now let's take a look at the northern terminus of the expressway. Just like at the south, the road seems to want to continue, but comes to an abrupt end just beyond the final exit to Jericho Turnpike. There were several different plans for the northern route, none of which came to fruition. The most ambitious of these plans was a bridge or tunnel across the Long Island Sounds connecting to Rye, New York, tying into I-287. Various versions of this plan have been proposed over the past century. This model from the Queen's Museum of Art shows one potential approach to the bridge. The road would continue north along Shore Road in Mill Neck before crossing Bayville and continuing across the Sound. Governor Cuomo addressed the topic as recently as 2018, noting that the high end of estimates for such a project would exceed $50 billion. A scaled back, more realistic vision for the expressway proposed a northern terminus in the village of Oyster Bay, which is how we got the current name. The expressway's end would serve as a direct connection to ferries leading out of Oyster Bay, crossing the Sound into Westchester and Connecticut. An even more scaled back plan was to have the expressway curve to the west and tie into Route 106. The right-of-way for this less grand proposal is still intact, just like in Seaford. Beyond the abrupt end of the road in Woodbury, you can follow a discernible line in the landscape that curves northwest through Woodbury, Syosset, and Muttontown, ending at Route 106, slightly north of Muttontown Road. Since the expressway's completion, proponents of a northern extension over the Sound have continually searched for a way to make it work citing a potential relief to the congestion on the Long Island Expressway. However, the question still remains, does the relief of traffic justify the $50 billion price tag?
So although Long Island has boomed in development over the past century, many indicators of its past as a rural escape remain frozen in time. Next time you're sitting in traffic, instead of succumbing to road rage, take the time to look around and see if you can spot one of the many historic land features hiding right in plain sight. There is a whole lot more to explore in the next episode of Long Island's Hidden History.